Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'm Lee Emil Zarek. I'm the Executive Director with Lupus Canada. I have to say we're honored that you're able to join us this evening. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to Lupus Canada's self-advocacy webinar. We're very excited to have Health Minister Patty Hadou with us this evening. Minister Hadou is a Canadian Liberal politician who was elected to represent the riding of Thunder Bay Superior North in the House of Commons of Canada in the 2015 federal election. Since November 2019, Minister Hadou has been the Minister of Health in the federal cabinet. Just want to go over a couple little um, housekeeping items before we begin. For this evening's webinar, we are everyone is placed in listen-only mode, so audio and video have been disabled. And Minister Haidu will address pre-submitted questions. Thank you to everybody who sent those in. I'd, all, I'd like to welcome at this time, Minister Haidu. Mr. Haidu, thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I really do wish that we were all here together or there together, somewhere <laughs> together, anywhere together. It's the end of a long day in front of a camera. So I appreciate, uh, and maybe you have people from all different time zones, but I do appreciate folks uh, sticking around a little longer um, to attend. And uh, it is such a privilege to be Canada's Minister of Health. And it's such a relief to talk about something besides COVID, although I understand we have some <laughs> intersection, um, but it is, it is nice to turn our attention to other conditions that people are living with in Canada and life-threatening conditions like lupus. Um, I am speaking Speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people of the Robinson Superior Treaty area. Um, many Métis people have contributed to this area as well, and I've been here for most of my life, uh, brief periods away uh, as a university student and other, you know, travels in my life, but this is where I call home. Very grateful to be uh, living in Northern Ontario. So, um, as you mentioned, May is Lupus Awareness Month and May 10th is International Lupus Day. So first of all, I want to congratulate everyone at Lupus Canada for the hard work that you have consistently performed to raise awareness of lupus and those people that are living with the disease. And of course, uh, you know, continuing that work during a global pandemic. Uh, this is a very difficult disease it, and it does affect so many Canadians. And so, um, you know, it's been our honor as a government to increase our investment in lupus research through Can the Canadian Institutes of Health Research over the past five years. Over 1.8 million committed specifically to this area of study last year alone. And we have also been moving forward with several pharmacare related initiatives that I know the lupus community has uh, strongly advocated for. Um, and of course, pharmacare has been on our agenda for a number of years and in no small part because of the advocacy of many uh, patient groups, including Lupus Canada, to have more affordable medications for Canadians. There's some real gaps, as we know, across the country in terms of drug coverage. While some Canadians have the benefit of benefits, no pun intended. Many do not. And having uh, prior to politics worked in a workplace where we did have some benefit coverage, but it was a not for profit shelter. Sometimes the coverage can be um, spotty, even for those people that do have uh, benefits that are covered through their workplace. And so these barriers that continue uh, to be uh, in existence for so many Canadians really uh, you know, reduce people's capacity to get the prescription drugs that they need when they need it, oftentimes the most vulnerable people. And of course, we know that that not only affects their health outcomes, but all of the other outcomes uh, that are connected to, I think, increasingly, as we are aware, uh, are the need for personal health in order for everything else to be uh, to be functional. And so budget 2019, as you know, included commitments to continue to build the foundation for the implementation of national pharmacare, including the Canadian Drug Agency Transition Office, a national formulary and a national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases. And these commitments were reaffirmed in the speech from the throne in the fall economic update and budget 2021, which was released last month, reiterated that ongoing commitment to moving forward with the implementation of Pharmacare, a national universal Pharmacare and a national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases. Now, we are currently working with patients, with partners, in particular with provinces and territories. There are some that are extremely excited about this, others that are not. But nonetheless, uh, we do have strong partnerships that we're working with to advance these really, really important foundational initiatives that will help us to move forward into the actual uh, conversation about 
who pays for what and how it unfolds across the country. And one of those important steps was indeed uh, the standing up of the Canadian Drug Agency Transition Office. Now this has been created within Health Canada and this allows for that dedicated capacity and leadership to advance work on pharmacare related initiatives. It improves the coordination and alignment in the pharmaceutical management system. It also develops a vision for the for Canadian Drug Agency. And the transition office, office will also work closely with partners to develop a national formulary, a comprehensive evidence-based list of prescribed drugs that are most commonly prescribed, that are needed by patients across the country. There are a number of ways to look at this, but certainly we'll be consulting with patient groups as we go forward with creating that uh, comprehensive list. And again, this is really trying to get at that idea that no matter where you live in the country, you should have access to the most needed prescribed drugs. And um, I do think that um, there are many uh, lists and, and suggestions of lists that we can draw from, but of course we want something to be specific to the needs of the country. And you all know that we're working towards the establishment of a national strategy for high cost drugs and rare diseases, for rare diseases. And earlier this year, Canadians, patients, families were invited to share their ideas and views on what that strategy could look like. We have a what we heard report that summarized key themes and feedback that emerged during the public stakeholder engagement sta uh, uh, stage. And this is going to be published very shortly. And so I'm excited to get those out. And of course, uh, we're having ongoing discussions with provinces and territories who, by the way, are largely uh, very positive about having uh, a national strategy that uh, um, um, uh, that there are, and their enthusiasm allows us to have a view that we could launch this strategy by uh, sometime in 2022. And so we can see work is happening. It's um, it's not easy work because, of course, as you know, uh, healthcare is a shared um, responsibility and and largely uh, actually controlled by uh, provinces and territories. But we believe, as a federal government, we have a very active role in helping. Um, incent provinces and territories, support provinces and territories, and certainly lead uh, these these um, these approaches, these national approaches that uh, increase equity, if you will, in access to a medication for people that are living with uh, illness or that are needing to treat illnesses uh, and, and can't access uh, medications. And so, again, this is all through the lens of trying to improve accessibility, affordability, appropriate use. Um, and of course, uh, I'm sure there are many members in your community that will uh, recognize uh, some of the need within, within the communities and within their own stakeholder groups. So I do wanna thank Lupus Canada for the invitation to speak. I also, again, thank all of the partners that are here. There are many uh, involved in lupus research and awareness, uh, all very important um, aspects, as you know, of getting attention for um, ongoing uh, and, and in some cases rare diseases. And I really, want to uh, you to know that we're with you and that we will not forget you despite how busy uh, the pandemic has made all health ministers across the country. Um, uh, I personally have uh, a strong commitment to the ongoing other health needs of Canadians, including people that are living with lupus. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thomas, did you want to ask some of the questions we had? I think I think Minister Haidu addressed some of them in her uh, her speech there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for for joining us today. My name is Thomas Simpson. I'm on the board of Lupus Canada and our uh, uh, the chair of our advocacy committee. So thank you again for for joining us. I, I think I can start off uh, one of our first questions that we do uh, that we had submitted uh, from folks living with lupus across the country. Um, as it is uh, Lupus Awareness Month, the whole idea of the month is to raise awareness around lupus. Um, so, so the first question we have is, uh, what, are you, what is the government uh, doing that could help support making lupus uh, more visible uh, across the country? I'm sure that you get asked this question a lot with other um, you know, uh, patient advocacy groups, but um, since it is Lupus Awareness Month, we'd start, we'd start off there. Well, that's a great question. And I think the, the sort of short answer is that the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, generates a tremendous amount of knowledge and um, 
you know, disseminates that research evidence as well as it, you know, uses that research to mobilize new health solutions and, and tries to translate it into, um, you know, easily digestible information, but also ensure that scientific publications are made openly available to anyone, including healthcare professionals, med medical educators, patients, and decision makers. As well, I think the value that CHR plays, uh, or sorry, places on uh, patient participation in the research process is it, it critically important. And you know, I, I draw on other um, other experiences of my work life where. Uh, oftentimes the motto, it was not about us without us. And I think that patient perspective of lived experience that helps guide research objectives is another way that uh, we not only highlight awareness of lupus, but use people with lived experience to highlight areas of um, uh, a need for, for uh, research questions. Uh, CIHR works closely with patient groups such as Lupus Canada to share those, uh, uh, you know, those research priorities. And I think um, CHR institutes such as the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis and Institute of Infection and Immunity, again, an important um, component in terms of convening the various communities, stakeholders and patient populations. So I know that's all research heavy, but I think it's important because it is, it is an indication of how you can use research and the patient community. And then when you pull those two things more closely together, first of all, you get to an ability for researchers to understand patients and their needs, but also patients to understand research and how to disseminate it. And I think that uh, it is the patient groups that understand how best to speak to Canadians, not always the researchers, although I, I know there's lots of researchers online, but I think that uh, is it that integration of both voices that's critically important. Great. Thank you. The next question we have is um, understanding some research is indicating potential blood clots from AstraZeneca vaccine. Should lupus patients who have received their first dose be concerned? So here's our tie in to COVID. We couldn't let yeah. them go. <laughs> That's okay. And you know what? It's there. Everything's tied to COVID. I was kind of half joking at the beginning that it's nice <laughs> to talk about something, but I don't, I don't know about you, but I haven't had a day where I haven't thought about, talked about, or read about COVID. So it's exactly. all fair. And I understand that. And of course, when you're living with a, a chronic illness, um, when you're living with a serious illness, of course, any additional threat to your health um, must make patients extremely worried. And so, um, first of all, let me just say that um, there, there have been no specific risk factors identified that would place people at having an increased risk of these type of rare unusual blood clots. For example, there's been no link with autoimmune diseases in general or lupus specifically identified. Um, I think Health Canada uh, obviously continually uh, assesses available evidence and is always looking at the link between uh, these rare blood clots with other kinds of conditions that might exist. And, you know, we are learning as a world about these events, but again, uh, want to stress they are very rare, um, you know, a lower risk of, um, and, and, there, and by the way, there's a much lower risk of having these types of clots with the second dose of that vaccine. And we're, we're lucky that we have countries ahead of us in uh, the use of AstraZeneca in particular second doses to be able to understand um, that phenomenon. So that's, that's good news. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say that, um, in terms of second doses, the government is working very carefully to make sure that we have access to second doses of AstraZeneca um, and are certain that we will, uh, should uh, patients want uh, to, or it's recommended that they use AstraZeneca as a second dose. And this will depend on provinces and territories decisions um, as they move forward and understand more on the dose mixing uh, approach and the data on that. But we will have, uh, we will have options for Canadians, uh, regardless of the direction of NACI and the other provincial and territorial uh, immunization expert panels. And so I think, you know, I want all Canadians who, including me, who has received AstraZeneca to know that there is a plan for second dose and that people will be safe and they will be protected and, and uh, we will get people immunized who have received AstraZeneca. About 2.3 or so million Canadians have had a first dose of AstraZeneca. So uh, we are working right now to make sure that there is a plan for those folks because uh, in, indeed uh, it's important that people 
people do get that second dose. We do know that there's certain symptoms, uh, unusual symptoms that indicate that someone might need uh, medical attention. And so we're really trying to amplify with provinces and territories what those unusual symptoms might be, like a persistent and severe headache, vocal neurological symptoms or visual, visual changes like blurred or double vision or, or episodes suspicious for seizure, shortness of breath, abdominal chest pain, swelling and redness in a limb, pallor and coldness in a limb, unusual bleeding, multiple small bruises, reddish or purple spots or blood blisters under the skin. So you can see there's a list of symptoms and it's really important even if you have, uh, or if any patient has even, um, you know, any of those symptoms that they reach out to their healthcare provider for, uh, for next steps. Um, I'll also say that all of the authorized vaccines are extremely effective at preventing serious illness and death. So I want to thank everyone who has been vaccinated, uh, regardless of which type, because uh, that work that we're doing together as Canadians is going to protect obviously us, but our families and our communities. And it is indeed a big part of getting out of um, the public health restrictions, which are also playing, uh, you know, placing a significant challenge on communities. Mm -hmm. So we will have more information soon uh, from the international studies on second dosing. And um, regardless of which way provinces and territories go, we will have the capacity to support patients to make those informed choices. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I myself had the AstraZeneca yeah. vaccine too. So <laughs> I'm one of those many million. <laughs> there you go. That's right. And you know, Canadians stepped up in volumes and I think it's a big part of what we're seeing in terms of case decline. So I'm really excited that uh, so many people have done that for themselves and their communities. Wonderful. That's great. That's great. We talked a little bit um, about Lupus Awareness Month. We're curious, um, what, what have you learned about lupus and Lupus Awareness Month um, that you didn't already know? Well, uh, it's a really complex disease, but I will say coming from a family with autoimmune um, diseases, I was, uh, I, was, I was surprised to see how similar it is to some of the other autoimmune diseases that people live with. Um, certainly, you know, I think what's interesting and what's challenging about lupus is the episodic and um, nature of it. And, uh, you know, just reflecting on living with a mother who had colitis, um, also an autoimmune disease, um, it, it, is, it is a really big challenge for people to manage a disease like that, that can be, and also that can be um, invisible to the rest of the world. And I think that for me, not that I didn't know that, but that for me is always an important uh, uh, thing to reflect on when we're talking about some of these autoimmune diseases is that, you know, you look perfectly normal. And so folks have a really hard time understanding your different energy levels, your different abilities, and what might be going on in your life. And I think that is worth repeating over and over and over that, um, you know, and I always say this when I'm talking to kids about uh, disability, that, you know, there's disabilities that we can see, and there's disabilities that we can't, and they all matter. So I think, um, obviously, there's a ton of research that's developed, being developed, and that's, you know, obviously not within my scope necessarily to be that detailed. But I think what, what for me, uh, this is, uh, you know, Lupus Awareness Month is most important. I think the most important role is to help other Canadians understand, A, just how difficult this disease is, how dangerous this disease can be, um, you know, how it can really affect people's uh, outcomes and their their day-to-day -day lives, but also how how difficult it can be for people just from the perspective of others not understanding how difficult it is to live with lupus. And I think those are all really important reflections. Absolutely. It's one of our major initiatives to try and create that public awareness through social media and other, other forms to really create that awareness to others, like you mentioned, outside of family and friends um, that are living or impacted by lupus. Because once we get that, more people will understand the disease and hopefully we'll make lupus visible by that point. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't yeah. it? That you have to try and make these, these diseases visible and that um, for the casual bystander, you know, they, they may not understand or an employer may not understand or a school, yeah. you know, may not understand. And so I think we have to do more together to help mm -hmm. people understand um, just how debil debilitating uh, some of these autoimmune diseases, including lupus, 
uh, are to mm-hmm. your everyday functioning. And uh, mm-hmm. I know that's something that my mother struggled with uh, the entire time that she, well, she now has an ileostomy, but the entire time that she was living with, uh, with colitis, uh, it was very difficult because it's inside the body and people, mm-hmm. you know, don't see it. And so don't understand the fatigue, mm-hmm. the pain, you know, the ongoing battles with medication and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's an important uh, reckoning that that uh, a recognition from on my behalf, but also on I think that we have to pursue together with Canadians. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Thomas. Did you have uh, another question you'd like to ask? Sure, absolutely. You think after almost a year and a bit, I'd be figuring out how to unmute myself better, but yeah, <laughs> here we are. It's the end of the day. <laughs> it is. And the long weekend is almost here. Um, well, thank you again, Minister. Um, I, I think you can anticipate, you know, for such um, small organizations, you know, like, like Lupus Canada, that really are um, grassroots, uh, trying to, to support, you know, a number of Canadians across the country. Funding is always you know, at the back of our minds, how are we going to be able to continue to support Canadians living with lupus from coast to coast to coast? Um, so my question is about, about funding, I'm sure, uh, your favorite question to be asked. But, um, you know, uh, what, I guess, what types of supports do the Canadian government have uh, for groups like Lupus Canada to then further support our, our research or, or support further research uh, in the academic community and for further awareness of the disease? Right. Well, through the CIHR, the Government of Canada supports the work of Canadian academics and hospital-based researchers. And CIHR also collaborates with not-for-profits and charities, patient organizations, again, as I said, to really work with individuals, patient groups to advance shared research priorities. So for example, CIHR and Lupus Canada have an active funding agreement to support human immunology research teams. And this represents a commitment of 4.92 million from CIHR and 160,000 by Lupus Canada. And uh, researchers can also work directly with organizations such as Lupus Canada to strengthen, strengthen those CIHR funding proposals. So we're always looking for a way to to, um, increase, as I said, the voices of patient groups and, um, you know, advocacy groups into that research agenda. I think there's opportunities as well to, um, you know, partner on the, the communications outward, um, outward communications piece to Canadians that we were just talking about. And I'm always happy to explore what that might look like with patient groups, because, uh, you know, as we've said, research is very important. That knowledge translation is really important for people to understand what the research says in clear language. We could all use some of that. But I think just the general awareness is an opportunity as well to explore in a little more detail as we go forward. And and I think, you know, obviously there's all levels of government working on this, but I think the federal government has such a loud voice in this space that there's, we're always open to looking for new opportunities to partner. Thank you. Well, we don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know you've been very busy today. So um, we just wanted to to thank you ever so much for taking the time to participate in our webinar this evening. Uh, We're a small group and to have you be able to attend has really um, been wonderful for us and for our lupus community. So we appreciate you helping us put a spotlight on lupus, especially during Lupus Awareness Month. Well, thank you for having me and please stay as well as possible uh, during COVID-19. I mean, uh, not only are we uh, worried about people's physical wellness, but obviously people's mental wellness. And so I would encourage you to share with your members, uh, if you haven't already, the wellnesstogether.ca portal and encourage people to check it out. It's, uh, it's, it's a free mental health resource for all Canadians. Um, there's an, there's a, a really neat mental health assessment tool you can use, but you can get directly connected to uh, paid professional counselors, et cetera. Uh, there's a special use section. It's available in both official languages and there's translation for 60 others. And I only say this because I, you know, my own family members have struggled and uh, it's just been a really hard time for everyone. So please don't forget about the mental health aspect of staying well during the pandemic and share that useful resource with your members. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. We will definitely share that with our with our audience. Um, just to let everyone know that a recording of tonight's webinar will be available on our website within 24 to 48 hours. And I'd just like to thank everyone who joined us this evening. Have a wonderful long weekend and a safe one.
Thank you very much, Leanne and everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.